Okay, so um, as promised, we're back talking about enhanced geothermal systems. Okay, um, so the general idea here is that the deeper you drill, the hotter it gets. And um, if you really want to produce geothermal electricity at the utility scale, so that's like, you know, the gigawatt scale or, or, or something, something like that, um, then you've got to drill very deep to harness um, the you know, thermal energy that's down there. Um, part of the problem with rocks that are very deep is they are um, they are very hard. That's the thing about rocks is that they get harder generally the deeper you drill to a point. Okay, once you get down to the mantle, it's hot and things are softer. But at least within the crust, um, you typically have very hard rocks, and they're hard because they don't have very much porosity. And that means they don't have very many, you know, very much in the way of flow pathways for water to move around. So your ability to do heat exchange can be quite limited in those rocks, unless you do something uh, to enhance the permeability of your rock so you can easily circulate fluids between an injection well and a production well. And that's what enhanced geothermal is. You're taking the geothermal energy that's down there and you're enhancing it or you're enhancing enhancing the rocks anyway um and so you know you're typically doing this when you've got subsurface temperatures in excess of 200 degrees celsius so again that's kind of your benchmark for producing steam at the surface um deep low porosity rock and you're generally um going to be doing some type of a hydraulic fracture stimulation to enhance the permeability of the existing fracture network because those rocks are generally already kind of highly fractured. Uh, well, maybe not highly fractured, but they have existing fractures. And so you're taking advantage of those um, when you stimulate these wells. So enhanced geothermal fracking is a little bit different from the type of hydraulic fracture stimulation we would do in an unconventional resource. Um, and the, the reason for that is that in a shale, when you frack it, you are creating new fractures, okay? Whereas in enhanced geothermal, you're opening up pre-existing fractures for the most part. You might be creating new ones as well, but it's generally you're opening up pre-existing ones. So the way it works is um, you've got maybe some existing fracture in the rock, and because Maybe it formed in response to a previous state of stress where now the, the stress field in the subsurface has reoriented for some reason or, or whatever. It's being held shut because there is a normal force acting. Okay, So what you do is if you've drilled a well and you've intersected this fracture, you can pump highly pressurized fluid into the subsurface and open that fracture up. Okay, Now, what happens when you open it up initially, because you're injecting pressurized fluid in here, you're only imparting normal stresses on the fracture wall. And so it's going to, uh, it's going to open normal to the fracture surface. So it'll open directly uh, as shown by these small arrows here. But then what's gonna happen is because you've got this background stress field where you've got some shear stress components acting on this fracture plane, you're going to have slip along that fracture, okay? And then when you re release the pressure, the fracture will close again. But now it's going to close in a different spot than it was before. And the roughness on the fracture surface here will hopefully um, open up some new flow pathways uh, for you to be able to exchange fluids through, okay? Now, what's nice about enhanced geothermal is that you don't need to use anything to prop open the fracture. There's no propant that's necessary. That doesn't mean you can't use it, but it's not strictly necessary because you're using the little asperities on the surface of the fracture to give you, um, to give you that open. Okay. Now, one thing you'll notice is this slippage behavior. We'll come back to this later on, but this is basically an earthquake. This is what an earthquake looks like. It's a shear slip on a fracture. And so there's always going to be some induced seismicity aspect to enhance geothermal. You just can't get away from it. So the key is managing 
the induced seismicity is that it doesn't grow to a level where you're actually producing a damaging earthquake. Okay, um, so for those of you who are not petroleum engineers and are less familiar with fracking, it's basically you're pumping a highly pressurized fluid into the subsurface, and that fluid is generally going to be water-based with, you know, stuff in it to help you pump it better and react better downhole. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting um, is that you can add chemicals that might dissolve or etch the surface of the fracture a little bit to enhance the permeability. Um, so that's another, another thing you can do. Um, okay. And typically with enhanced geothermal, you may, you often have to go in and re-stimulate the well because over time, this fracture may kind of heal itself shut. You might get mineral precipitation inside of it. So, you know, this, this is going to be a, a continual, uh, continual process. Okay. And, um, there's uh, a, a difference in the pressure response as well that you can measure at the surface depending on whether you're um, creating new fractures or uh, reactivating existing ones. And it kind of looks like this. So in a typical hydraulic fracture stimulation where you're making new fractures, the pressure versus time is going to look something like this where you've got an initial spike where you, you initially open up that fracture. So the fracture isn't there. You have to overcome the tensile strength of the rock to create that fracture in the first place. Um, and then what's gonna happen is once you've created the fracture, the fracture will propagate and you'll get this uh, kind of leak off behavior as the pressure in the wellbore bleeds off into the fracture. And then um, after you shut in the well, the uh, fracture will eventually kind of shut itself a little bit, and then the remaining pressure will bleed off into the, uh, the fracture system, okay? But that initial crack generation is important. And when you're doing enhanced geothermal, if you've got pre-existing fractures, um, you're not gonna have that spike there. So you just have fractures that are already there, you just make them wider. And then again, after you stop pumping, you'll bleed off the pressure into the fractures that you've, you've widened. So it's a little bit of a different um, type of response that they use. Okay, and so you might be wondering, you know, when you stimulate these wells, how much volume are you actually, are you actually stimulating? Um, so here is um, what we call microseismic data. So these are frequently collected during an enhanced geothermal stimulation. Um, you'll often have an observation well that is drilled somewhere near the primary geothermal well. And you would have a series of hydrophones inside that well that listen for acoustic waves coming out of the rock. And then those data get processed and they can kind of source locate all of the acoustic events. And it gives you some understanding of where the actual cracks were being formed or being opened up in the uh, in the subsurface. So this is a plot. The different colors here correspond to different um, stimulation stages that they did um, in this well or these series of wells down here. But you can see in depth, you know, we're looking at a vertical scale of about a kilometer for this for the stimulation. And then similarly, if you look at the easting and northing axis, it's like hundreds of meters away from the wellbore. So you're stimulating a pretty large volume of rock um, with these uh, fracture operations. So it's, it's, actually, uh, it's actually pretty pretty efficient. Okay, and then the heat exchanger, um, you know, basically works the same way it does with a shallow geothermal system. Um, you pump the cold fluid down, it moves through the rock, and then you pump the hot fluid um, back out. Okay. Now, um, I added a little bit to this lecture because this um, has been in the news a little bit recently. Many of you have probably heard of this company called Fervo Energy. They're based out of Houston, and they have really made some pioneering moves in the enhanced geothermal space. Um, they had some initial success um, at this location in northern Nevada called the uh, Blue Mountain Project. Um, more recently, they're expanding their operations in Utah at the Cape Station, where I think they just 
like two days ago, they got approved for like several gigawatts of electricity generation there. So they're really doing great things. Um, this is the location of Blue Mountain. It's kind of northwest of um, Winnemucca. And it um, there already was some existing geothermal wells. This is an area that the, you know, Nevada is kind of an interesting state because it's getting bigger over time. It's stretching apart um, because there's kind of a, I wouldn't say a failed rift, but the rifting in the Gulf of California kind of propagates north into the basin and range here. And so the mantle is actually very close to the surface. And so there's a lot of hot springs and mineral deposits and stuff, but it's also a good place to do geothermal because you don't have to drill that deep to get hot rocks. So there are some old geothermal wells here. And what they, what Fervo went in and did was they drilled a couple of horizontal wells. That was kind of one of their key innovations. So they have um, an injection well and then a uh, production well. So again, this is for doing a, hydro, a deep hydrothermal doublet. Um, and then here's um, their observation well for doing things like micro seismic monitoring um, and that, that sort of thing. Um, here is a depth section showing um, where the wells are. So they drilled down, the kickoff point was around 7,7500 7, feet below the surface. And then let's see, you can see that the lateral length here is on the order of about 1,500 feet. So, you know, not terribly impressive when you think about some of the lateral lengths that they're drilling out the Permian Basin, um, but still pretty good because this is, you know, you can see the uh, lithology here. It's, um, you know, they're calling it phyllite. That's, you know, a type of uh, igneous rock. So they're drilling through pretty hard stuff here. Um, and then let's see, these brown lines here are the isotherms. So you can see down here, they're, you know, almost reaching, that's the 200, 200 Celsius isotherm down there. So they're at about 180, 180 Celsius. So, um, so pretty good. And um, this is their micro seismic monitoring of the fracture stimulation. Um, and you can see, um, that they stimulated a pretty large volume of rock. The red dots are just kind of all the events they were able to locate. And then the blue ones are the events that they were most confident that that was actual microseismic. Microseismic actually, it's, there's a little bit of an art to it that it's kind of, you're recording all these signals coming into the hydrophones and then like deconvolving that and reprocessing it. There's like a lot of kind of fudge factor type things that go into it. Um, so anyway, it it's, can be a little tricky and your results may not be, uh, be great. But you can see that what they were getting after was they were trying to create fractures that connected the injector and producer wells. And you can see they did a pretty good job of that, especially down um, in this uh, zone here, down towards the, uh, the toe of the, um, of the horizontals. And then um, their flow rates, um, when they did the, uh, the the flow test uh, between the wells, they were you know, markedly higher than any other enhanced geothermal tests that had been done uh, to date. So I should, when I showed you that microseismic earlier, that was from this uh, Soutsou Forets field in France. And that was the previous record holder, 30 liters per second, that they were achieving upwards of 60. And so, you know, again, when you think about it, the flow rate of the fluid that's directly related to the energy flux coming out of the subsurface because the more heat you have coming out the faster you have to flow and so your ability to do that is um, you know really important for extracting them so anyway um, they're a pretty cool company I know that we've had a couple of um, PGE grad students do internships uh, with them so I you know pay attention to them because I think it's uh, pretty neat what they're doing Okay, now let's imagine maybe drilling 7,500 feet deep isn't deep enough for you. What if you want to drill like a 20 kilometer deep well to get really hot fluids, okay? And the purpose of doing this is that if you get above the critical point of water, you're going to be dealing with supercritical water. Remember that supercritical fluids have a liquid-like density, but a gas-like, um, a gas-like viscosity, okay? And so that means two things. One is they're easy to pump 
because they have a low viscosity. And two, they can carry a lot of heat because they're dense. And so their specific heat capacity will be a lot higher. Um, so, um, and I think, you know, it's been shown uh, kind of in demonstration, you know, kind of laboratory benchtop demonstrations that if you're using supercritical water, you get 10 times as much useful energy from it than you do with a conventional geothermal plant. So there's a lot of advantages to doing this. Um, the problem with drilling ultra deep to ultra high temperatures is that a lot of the existing drilling and completion technologies that we have cannot work at those high temperatures. So, you know, as, as an example, um, when I was a wireline logger, the hottest that the downhole tools could withstand was 180 Celsius, okay? Now, if you're at 380 Celsius, there are no tools that you can use that'll work like that. Um, the drill bits get soft, they won't actually drill at that depth. Um, and so, you know, stuff will, you know, the failure rate will be a lot, a lot, um, a lot more rapid. So, you know, it's, the, it's difficult to do that with existing technologies. Um, the other thing is that if you are drilling at, you know, 10, 15 kilometers, if you do have something fail down hole, like your drill bit or something, then you've got to pull 15 kilometers of drill pipe out of the hole, and that would take you like a week. So, you know, Exi the, the existing technologies are not really adequate for this. So there are um, some companies that are actually working on new technologies for drilling ultra deep wells. And I know that here at UT, uh, Dr. Van Ort is involved in some of this research kind of on the materials side. So, you know, there's, you know, very smart people looking at this. Um, but kind of the, the stuff that's being looked at right now is rather than using, using like regular drilling, um, people are investigating using lasers or like using microwave uh, radiation or even um, plasma. And so, you know, they, there's advantages and disadvantages um, to all of these. Um, I think the millimeter wave has kind of has made the most progress so far because it um, doesn't use as much energy as lasers and um, it doesn't uh, get attenuated by the dust that it creates the way that lasers do. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So anyway, um, there's you know definitely some um, advances being made in this. One other thing is that any of these technologies, so if you're not using a regular drill bit, but if you're using one of these technologies where you're actually melting the rock, what happens is that after you drill the hole, you don't have to run casing or cement or anything because the rock right around the borehole is vitrified. So it's turned into like a glass and that will hold the hole open. So you don't need any kind of completions for this. You just, you just drill. Um, so some of these early tests, this is going back you know, 10 years now, um, this is a group, uh, they're at um, MIT, I believe, just doing some tests of, this is millimeter wave, so basically like a micromate. It's millimeter wave electromagnetic radiation. And just, you know, seeing how much energy and how much time is required to melt different types of rocks that you might see in the subsurface. So, you know, some of these tests, you know, 30 minutes, 44 minutes to melt just a little bit of rock. So they've come a long way. And actually, there's a couple of companies now that exist that are, um, I think, close to commercialization of some of these tech techniques. But um, so, you know, we'll see, we'll see where this goes. Um, this was one company in particular that's working on millimeter waves. They're called Quays. And I think they were either, um, oh, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. But, um, but yeah, I think they, as far as I know, I had somebody did a, a news item presentation on them last year, and I think they were close to rolling out their technology, but I haven't heard anything since then. So, um, so I don't know. So uh, this slide still is correct, may be deployable soon. Um, so we'll see, uh, we'll see where this goes. Um, plasma also is another um, possibility here. And uh, this company, GA Drilling, got a big investment from Neighbors. Neighbors is, I think, the largest drilling contractor in the world. They run a lot of rigs. Um, so, you know, they're interested in some of these technologies. So 
so like I said, we'll see, um, we'll see where this goes. It's promising and I think it's still early days, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. If you're able to use like the plasma drilling or like lasers, would that be applicable within like the oil and gas sector as well? Or is that something really expensive that way? Like the current, you know, that we have? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I can think of, well, okay, so for one thing, you don't want to run the risk of combusting your product that you're trying to produce, right? So, but, you know, let's imagine you can get around, you can get around that cost, um, that, that problem. I mean, maybe, maybe. I think, you know, the, you did bring up the issue of cost, and I think that's the big thing right now. A lot of these are energy intensive, okay? Mm -hmm. And so just the cost per foot, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how it breaks down versus conventional drilling, but I'd, I'd imagine it would be substantially more. Um, but if you can bring that down and you can show that you can drill faster, uh, you know, bring it down or drill faster so that the total time is less than, you know, could be something you could look at. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Okay. Um, now there's a couple of issues. Yeah, actually, that that's an, actually an important point I want to make about geothermal um, drilling. Um, I, you know, when we were talking about CCUS, I said you can't make money just storing carbon. Okay. Now you can make money doing geothermal because you can sell the electricity, but the problem with that is, you know, electric utilities typically don't run at very high profit margins. Okay. Here in Austin, actually, our utility is municipally owned, so I don't know what kind of profit they make, you know, if if any. But um, most of the time, like if you look at the big utilities, like you know, Centerpoint, Duke, you know, companies like that, um, their profit margins are not nearly as large as for oil and gas producers. So if you're running a geothermal company, you've got the capital expenditures of an oil and gas company because you're actually drilling. But then you've got the profit margin of the utility. So the, you know, the value proposition is a little bit different. But, you know, if you accept that and you say, OK, yeah, we can just you know, still make some money selling electricity, then, you know, go for it. Um, but that is an important thing to keep in mind. OK, so there's two issues with geothermal wells, and they have to do with fluid chemistry and enhanced seismicity. Um, so um, in terms of the fluid chemistry, um, hot fluids typically associated with geothermal usually have a lot of stuff dissolved in them. And that makes, you know, Yellowstone National Park a very cool place to visit because you've got, you know, this is Mammoth Hot Springs and you've got this travertine that's being precipitated out of the hot spring water. And then obviously you've got all these, you know, mineral deposits around uh, Grand Prismatic Spring also. Um, but these can cause a lot of problems to your downhole or even surface equipment um, because what happens is that for most salts, their solubility decreases when the temperature goes down. So as your hot fluid comes to the surface and cools down, the salts will start precipitating out. And you can get these really nasty uh, scale, to, you know, we call this scale that builds up inside flow lines and pipes and that sort of thing. And so um, it can also include radioactive elements. So, you know, potassium has a radio radioisotope. Um, what else? There's some, oh yeah, um, this is uh, cerium also has radioisotopes. So, you know, um, there's some kind of nasty stuff. Lead nitrate, lead is obviously not a good thing. So, um, you know, these can be, um, problematic and also maybe uh, potentially hazardous to health and the environment. So um, you can get around this by, you know, doing your homework ahead of time, figuring out what the fluid chemistry is, and then um, making sure that you design your system such that you don't have any, you know, kind of bends or corners or stuff where these salts are likely to build up. Um, and then, you know, there, you can also use, you know, special coatings on your materials to prevent scale um, and then have an intervention. So that's that's the biggest thing. Just accept that this is going to happen and then figure out how frequently you need to run your descaling operation or, or whatever. So that's, that's about the best you can do. Okay, um, I'm going to deviate a little bit because 
there's also the possibility that you might encounter um, gas or other things when you're drilling. And you need to be careful about that. Um, and some of y'all might actually research this particular case um, in Switzerland for our um, group project, but I just want to draw your attention to it. So this was the St. Gallen um, uh, geothermal project. It's way up here in far northeastern Switzerland. And they had a big problem with induced seismicity here, which um, kind of a post-mortem analysis indicated that it was possibly that they had drilled into a gas bearing zone. So what we're looking at here, this is a map showing faults in the area. You can see they all kind of strike northeast, southwest. Um, and then all these dots here are the locations of different seismic events that occurred during the drilling of this well, um, along with a couple of the larger ones here. There was a three magnitude three and a half earthquake um, that caused, you know, that people felt, I think it caused a little bit of damage nearby. Um, these, um, you know, so seismologists like to use these beach balls to represent the motion on the fault, but basically this shows that it's a strike slip fault. Um, and um, so they went back and kind of did some analysis. So they, they stopped drilling and they abandoned the project after that. And they said, okay, no, no more drilling here. And then they went back subsequently and tried to figure out what had happened. So um, what we're looking at here is, let's see, this is A to A prime is going to be the figures here on the left. And then B to B prime, which is orthogonal to that, is going to be the figures here on the right. So what we're looking at, if you look at A to A prime, this is kind of a sequence of what happened. So they did an injection test and then they acidized. So they actually pumped acid down there to etch into the fractures to increase the permeability. Um, and then they encountered, a, they took a gas kick at the surface. Um, and so this is an interpretation of what happened. So during the injection test, they had drilled down here into this, um, these Jurassic sediments. And they think that they had encountered a high permeability fracture zone. So when they injected the fluid down the well, that pressurized fluid went into that fracture zone and came down here and encountered a fault that was sealing a gas reservoir. And then that fault started slipping. And so they were able to locate the seismic events along that fault. And then the fault slipping then uh, released some of the gas that it had been sealing. It had a whole bunch of more seismic events. And then the gas came back up here, intersected the well, and, um, and went to the surface. And so then that's also reflected over here in the, the orthogonal uh, cross section. So, you know, it's a bunch of stuff that went wrong here, but part of this was, you know, not having good characterization of the subsurface and also, um, you know, not really having a good plan for mitigating um, the induced seismicity. So the induced seismicity is always a problem, like I said, with enhanced geothermal because you're inherently causing slip on a fracture plane. And that's what an earthquake is. Now, if that slip is small enough and that fracture plane is small enough, your seismicity will be below kind of a detectable limit. You won't be able to feel it. You know, a sensitive instrument can measure it, but you won't feel it. And so you want to try to prevent larger events. Um, and the reason that this happens, again, you can think about this in terms of the more Coulomb failure envelope, that if you're sitting on a fracture that's at this state of stress, then you're, everything's fine. But if you suddenly inject fluids into it, you're reducing the effect of stress, and that'll drive the more circle to the left to the point where you do experience shear slippage. Um, now, you're obviously trying to do that to some degree, but you want that slip not to be very large. And so it's very important to try to, um, to, try to monitor that. Most in, or any enhanced geothermal project now is going to have a plan. They use a red light, yellow light, green light um, scenario. They're constantly monitoring during the stimulation and they're looking at the magnitude of the seismic events coming in. And you know, if everything's good, they'll be operating under green light. If they get a couple of larger events, they'll have to ramp down their pressures, um, take some action, and then red light is like, stop, you need to stop what you're doing. So um, anyway. Um, 
we measure the magnitude of seismic events using two scales. Um, one is called the Mercalli scale, and that has to do with the sensed, um, uh, you know, sensible ground motion. And then that there's also the uh, the Richter scale, which is related to the amount of energy um, that's released. And um, currently, right now, is when you see the magnitude reported, it's typically going to be what we call the moment magnitude, and that's related to this m zero, which is called the seismic moment. And that has to do with the fault surface area and the average displacement, as well as this uh, rigidity term. So that's um, that's how they're related. And you can see how the Richter magnitude maps onto the Mercalli scale over here. So I told you this two and a half magnitude is usually a rough cutoff for where they'll start taking action during an enhanced geothermal stimulation. Because anything below two and a half you can see that it's barely detectable, um, right? So a magnitude two, you might not even notice, and anything below about a one and a half, you can't you can't detect. So you want your microseismic events to be kind of in this range here. But you know that magnitude three and a half that I showed you from the St. Gallen um, well, that can be felt. It can break windows. It can knock dishes off um, off the shelf. So you know, you're already getting to the point where you, you are causing some damage there. Okay. So um, that brings us to the end here. And um, what we're going to do for our project starting on Friday, I'll post the brief for that probably later today, um, is um, we'll be re uh, you'll be tasked with researching one of these uh, induced seismicity events that um, are reported in the, or listed in the Stover and Booker book and talk about what the ramifications are, specifically about um, how the public accepts um, the ability of the geothermal industry to operate um, in their communities. So um, you've got that to look forward to, but that's gonna do it for today. Um, I hope you'll have an excellent rest of your Wednesday, except for those of you who are in petrophysics, which all I can say is I'm sorry. <laughs> We have an exam later. Okay, um, but I'll see you all Friday.